Health and Fitness with David Hollywood with the all-new Midlands Park Health and Fitness Club. MidlandsParkHotel.com Midlands 103 Hello and welcome to the programme. Let's have a look at what's coming up on this week's show. For bands, Brida Malini from Nismo Nutrition is on hand to talk about celiac disease and the benefits of a gluten-free diet. Leash Ladies Football are hosting a seminar on innovative coaching and an open day for fans to meet players, all to raise much-needed funds for the team. Their manager, Stephen Duff, tells us about why we should check it out. Buccaneers Minis Rugby is a massive hit. Declan Brady is the coordinator and joins us on Health and Fitness this week. And Robin Brassel and Elton from Offley Guide Dogs are in studio to talk about Guide Dog Day and their partnership with Tullamore Park Run. We're opening a topic that is very current, affects a great number of people, is, I think, a condition discussed a lot more these days uh, than it might have, do- might have been in the past. And this is a gluten intolerance. Some people have a gluten sensitivity. Uh, people suffer from a celiac disease. All of these things uh, can kind of fall under the same category of conversation, which means we must bring in Brida Malini, our nutritionist here on Health and Fitness. Uh, Brida, thanks very much for taking our call as ever. Thanks for being David. First off, I suppose I wanted to ask you in your experience as a nutritionist um, has this problem in your opinion become more prevalent or has people's awareness increased and it had existed all along or is it kind of a combo of both? It's kind of a combo of both um, because as probably as anyone that would have celiac disease would actually know that it's causes its condition that causes the immune system to attack its own tissues. So by doing that, it actually damages the intestinal lining um, and that prevents the absorption of nutrients. So when it's untreated, then you have things like anemia and osteoporosis, infertility, I mean, nerve damage, there can be neurological conditions. So it's quite a severe disease if, if it's unmanaged. But normally for people that um, kind of start looking at that particular road, tend to have looked at possibly things like IBS symptoms, mm. which can be quite similar. You have your um, constipation, diarrhea, a lot of stomach cramping, all of those sort of things which are quite common with IBS. So sometimes they just pass it off as IBS symptoms and don't actually get uh, possible checks done. Um, to see is there other things going on. And it, normally with celiac disease or when it gets severe, it's really associated with a lot of weight loss. Okay, so so when it gets yeah. severe, um, it, it people yeah. stop being able to, to ultimately eat healthily and the weight eat. falls off them? The weight just literally falls off them because they ha- a lot of the time it's very much associated with diarrhea. So it's just literally everything is just running through them basically. Mm. Yeah, so, I think it's important to to underline at this point. Uh, funny enough, actually, uh, or coincidentally, I think it's um, IBD, um, irritable yes. bowel disease um, day disease. coming up in the next week or so. And uh, we mm. are in uh, what is the awareness month uh, for celiac disease. Um, so uh, an interesting statistic about um, celiac sufferers is an estimated over 75% of them uh are misdiagnosed or undiagnosed and mm. without the diagnosis without looking into it uh, people really do suffer yes absolutely absolutely and i mean people will try various things as well you know people automatically would you know they think okay maybe you have a sensitivity to wheat um, and they'll cut out all wheat or sometimes they associate with the lactose intolerance as well because kind of the crossover of all that especially if you're googly <laughs> If you're using Dr. Google, those sort of mm. things will actually pop up. But until you actually get a blood test and possibly a colonoscopy um, to actually diagnose celiac disease or even IBD because people with Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, all of that, you know, that's all in the bowel area, it's all in the gut area. So it, there's a lot of damage that can be done if it's not managed well, at, you know. And if it is managed well, then we're talking about a, a very much livable lifestyle um, oh, gosh, and, and we're in a world that's catering uh, to celiacs a mm. lot better. So uh, if you've yep. got um, a client who uh, has celiac disease or has a gluten intolerance or sensitivity, um, where do you start uh, in, in, in building up a nutritional plan? 
Well, first of all, what you actually, if they have got their diagnosis and everything else um, and you are aware, you know, they are aware that this is the problem. First of all, they actually have to cut out um, anything that contains gluten. It's just they it has to go. So things like flour, your bread, baked goods, it tends to be in a lot of gluten tends to be in an awful lot of processed food. So, you you know, you're literally cutting out all of that out of your diet, which for any of us is good the highly processed foods so breads baked goods cereals pastas biscuits cake your soy sauce even beer soups processed meats and ready made sauces and meals a lot of them will contain gluten okay. so by cutting them out you've immediately reduced the load on your body um and the pushing and taking the pressure off your body and give it a chance actually to kind of recover and to heal so that's the first thing you do mm. and then after that, then you'd support the gut lining and the, the, micro, the micro, microbiome of the gut. Because even when you're using the gluten free products, that is, and there are plenty, there's tucks of them available, they're often lower in fiber and they tend to be higher in fat and sugar because obviously they're processed. So, and even with, say, the gluten equivalent of uh, the products that have gluten in them, that are the equivalent, say, like your cereals and, all, and breads and all that, they tend to be fortified. With vitamin B and iron and calcium, a lot of the wheat products are fortified with this, mm. whereas with the gluten-free products, they're not. So instantly, you're lower in that. And if you have what we would uh, in nutritional therapy ca- call a leaky gut, then you're not absorbing any, you know, the vitamins. When you do try, you you know, you're you're lacking in a certain amount of vitamins because it's just your body cannot absorb it. What do you do to make so, up the shortfall then? The shortfall, you supplement, you'd have to supplement omega-3, things like L-glutamine, which would actually kind of, you would try and heal the gut to prevent it from, you know, lessening the the depletion of the minerals like vitamin A, C, B, vitamin zinc, your vitamin E and K and your vitamin D. So you kind of add them in. You'd use also um, some plant-based protein powders and nutritional powders just to kind of, increase the intake of vitamins without putting so much pressure on the actual digestion. Yeah. So it kind of supports all of that. So you'd build, it would take time, obviously, to do the repair, uh, but and then obviously change your diet. And to be, you know, always very mindful of, we'll say, the shop-bought products, because a lot of them will say may contain, and they're the ones you avoid because if there's cross-contamination because of in factories are made in production lines, so there is cross contamination. So anything that will say that says may contain, avoid. If anyone gets a diagnosis uh, of celiac disease, for instance, and they mm. think, well, this is uh, a real negative, and I'm going to be struggling through getting uh, used to such changes in in my diet and so on. I suppose the, the other side of this coin, Brida, is as you've described there. If you were to uh, go and get rid of the gluten from your diet and make sure that you've, um, you're have you supplementing uh, the, the missing vitamins and nutrients that mm. you do need. Your overall diet, your overall health and your general well-being, am I projecting too much to say, would improve massively? Even, oh. even for me speaking today as a non-celiac, uh, if I were to mm. go gluten-free and make sure that I had the supplements to, to, to catch up on the mm. bits that are out, I've, I'm, I'm getting rid of a lot of processed food from my diet essentially. Absolutely. That's the thing. You see, for any of us, if, at the highly processed foods, we all should be getting rid of it, <laughs> basically out of our diets. They're doing none of us any good health wise, whether you're celiac, whether you have IBS, IBD, any of those, any condition, even things like I know, there, you know, there's a lot of talk coming up about fertility and celiac disease. Mm. And um, by removing all of that, you're you're preparing the body for pregnancy and you're making it as healthy as possible. So, you know, I know there's other factors that um, feed into the fact of fertility other than celiac disease, things like stress and high cortisol and all of those other things. Um, But if you remove the highly processed foods from your diet, and that would obviously, when you see the list, baked goods, cereals, cakes, biscuits, beers, processed meats, you know, ready-made sauces and ready meals, you can see, you know, regardless of what your health condition is, that has to be a benefit. 
Yeah, worth underlining the point you made about um, mm. conceiving generally because uh, it's estimated at least 6% of infer- infertility in men as well as women is due to oh, yeah. undiagnosed and untreated celiac disease. So if there's anybody listening there who are uh, going on um, a journey in terms of adding a member to the family and uh, they're finding it mm. difficult, it could be something to look into if it chimes with other symptoms. And uh, yeah. as you say, the key to so much of this, not all of this, because there's other mm. elements as ever, oh, but yes. the key to so much of it is is our nutrition and mm. how we treat uh, our gut health, essentially. Yes, absolutely. And, your, you know, in your gut is your immune system. It's uh, also the blood brain connection as well. So mood, anxiety, all of that. So it's all it's all featured in around your gut. There's so much going on there that when you have an auto, you know, your immune system is affected by celiac disease, which is an autoimmune condition, you know, it's putting so much pressure on your immune, on your system. You know, getting pregnant is not a priority for the body. The body's priority is to try and keep itself well and try and heal itself. So it takes away from other things to do that. Mm. So it's it, that's really what goes on with the body. The body will try and repair first before it tries to reproduce. And that's the way we survive. I think that's uh, an excellent place to leave it. Uh, Brida Malini, uh, if anyone wants to uh, avail of your expertise, uh, Nismo Nutrition is uh, the Instagram handle. I'm, as, yep. I'm right in saying that. Do uh, you yep. have any other yep. contact details you want to put out there? Yeah, um, my as a Nismo, Nismo nutrition is my main thing. So, which Nismo is the Irish for more than. So I, you know, I like to deal very holistically with people, and kind of cover a lot of areas, so we can get everybody, you know, a balance in life. I think. So Nismo nutrition, absolutely on Instagram. That's you'll find me there. Next up, we hear about the inspirational figures and innovative teachers you can learn from if you go to Mount Melick tomorrow morning. Health and fitness with the all-new Midlands Park Health and Fitness Club where relaxation meets rejuvenation. Find out more at midlandsparkhotel.com Midlands 103 Leash Ladies a Senior Football Team are hosting a coaching and development day this weekend in Mount Melick GA. I'm very glad to say that the Senior Football Team Manager Stephen Duff uh, has joined us on Health and Fitness uh, to look forward to it, um, maybe to give some people who might catch this chat a bit of incentive to get down to Mount Melick GA uh, tomorrow morning uh, or indeed um, to shine a light on the good work that's been done in the Amore County. Stephen, thanks for taking our call. No problem at all. Happy to take it. So the Coaching and Development Day, uh, tell us what's it in aid of, like the overarching goal from it and, and some of the bits and pieces going on that you're excited about. So, yeah, we are really excited about it. It's a twofold, um, really, objective for ourselves. Um, obviously, costs are increasing significantly. And in the ladies' game, uh, running of teams can be a really challenging um, task. So we need to fundraise. Um, we're looking at a new management team to really put the structures in place that will make Leash uh, sustainably successful for years to come. So we want to make sure that we're giving the girls every opportunity to be the best that they can be over the rest of the season and further into the future. And that just doesn't come cheaply. Um, so we're looking to fundraise for the group and the senior group specifically. Um, the remainder of the season, the money we seem to be going towards the, 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 the travel to games. We've got one away game in the All-Ireland Series and that won't be cheap because the cost of travel has gone so high. And then obviously... Uh, everything around that, like the expenses towards food uh, and, and, and training costs. So that's that part of it. But then on the other part of it, which is a really, really important part for us, is we want to connect with the county a little bit more. Um, there's that connection between club player and club clothes. Coach is gone. So on the day, we want to try and kind of get any club coach who wants to like learn a little bit. I'm a big promoter of every day is a learning day and you never know what kind of nugget of information that you'll find along the way. And We've three really experienced coaches there who are going to l- lend their knowledge to us. Pat obviously is a uh, a legend in leash, um, and everyone kind of has the height of respect for him, and probably more so since the Lake Regale um, episode that was shown on himself, and he really went into depth on his personal life. Um, we'll definitely get some yarns out of Pat, which is really <laughs> what he shares his uh, his experience through. Then we've got Evan Talty, who is uh, probably better known for his Twitter handle at I Gaelic Coach. 
um, or ex handle as it's now known. He is a coach with significant experience. Claire Galway, current Roscommon lads coach, which just recently won the Connacht title and narrowly lost to Tyrone last week. Um, across ladies and gents sports, uh, performance analysis and sports science. Um, really in-depth knowledge, uh, really technical type of guy. And he's going to present on the strengths of using a games-based approach in your session and taking away from the drill-based uh, and making players uh, be more enabled to make decisions on pitches and giving them that platform and training to, to do that and not just know how what school, skill to use, but tell them why, when and how, where to use it on the pitch. Okay. And then we've got uh, Stephen Poacher, who's probably well-known for his time with Carlo and Roscommon with Anthony Cunningham. Um, Stephen is very different as a coach, very focused on some of the intricacies of the game. Probably we view as a defensive coach, but he views himself more as a transitional coach and the moments in the game where we can't control uh, as best we can in our game plans. Uh, and he's going to discuss just kind of some tactical innovations that you can have at any level, whether you're an under-10 coach or whether you're a senior inter-county coach. There's probably little bits of tactical innovation that we can all look at and the, the uses of it and how we implement it. So across the day there, there's some real value for coaches and some nuggets of information we might pick up. But then on the connection piece, our senior panel have offered to kind of run an open training session for any young player that wants to come and see how a senior team operates. And as Mo said, that she'd love to show a girl how to take a free kick and if Sinead Farley can show someone how to take a tackle and just build that connection with younger girls so that they're more open and that they are looking up to the county players and that the county players are giving back to that younger player and give them that target or that drive or that penny drop moment that this is what the younger player wants to do. Stephen, I've come across plenty of fundraisers in my time here and before, uh, but this really, you've packed in so much value into it and uh, the overarching uh, purpose to support um, Leash Ladies Football uh, should be enough motivation, but the amount of knowledge that's on display here is really fantastic. And uh, I imagine uh, for Ladies football, which is developing a pace at uh, these kinds of events, uh, can actually provide great value for time spent. So spending time with someone like Evan Talty, uh, Pat Critchley, who is obviously an inspirational figure in and of himself, and Stephen Poacher. Um, these people uh, could help those who might turn up tomorrow to uh, really make huge strides if they uh, look to deliver even a percent of what they're talking about. Yeah, and like we were discussing fundraising ideas and we put it on the table quiz, which would give the value of a bit of entertainment. And there's always the raffle that you could do and sell lines. And I was like, girls, I think them days are, maybe they're not gone. They might be the easy to sell, but kind of we want to give value to someone who's parting ways at 20 euros um, because it is a significant amount of money and we don't know what challenges people have every week in parting with money. So I wanted to make sure that there was value to be gotten out there. And then twofold is there has to be a huge amount done around development of coaches within our county um i've been in the system of leash ladies football for 10 years and i don't think i've done a single lgfa led course within the county and that's no one's fault it's just the resources haven't been there i would have traveled around the country i was down in um clare for one that evan ran earlier this year with mick bahan and donald hughes and aidan o'sullivan and a lot of the stuff is is anecdotal evidence and you would have heard it here there but there's always a nugget of information that you can find and I don't believe there's anyone out there that knows everything. And if you do, I think you do know everything. You probably should move on from coaching because I think as coaches, we should always be looking to be better and understand ourselves a little bit better. And any new idea that is out there, we should be looking to try to grasp it and figure it out and see if where, if or when we want to apply it. So three, there's no three better men out there to really kind of vastly kind of challenge our thinking because Pat is going to look at skills development and anyone who's worked with Pat knows he's very good at that kind of, that space and relies an awful lot on storytelling. He has uh, names on every single game so that players can recognize uh, it very quickly and understand what it's for. Uh, Evan using the games based approach and really under- trying to get people to think about not just kick the ball from here to there and not tell the player when and how and where to use it, why to use it. And then obviously Stephen Poacher, which is going to look at really a tactical kind of piece and how can even underage coaches consider tactics because sometimes we see tactics as mass defense or, uh, high press when really it's just decision making on a pitch and allowing that player uh, kind of be making decisions in line with that overall tactical approach so why are they doing this how do they make that decision so I think for three hours of a Saturday or two and a half hours of a Saturday there's an awful lot of learning to be got from it but I think I think what, what I really ask is that like we are in a place where Leash Ladies Football where there's kind of 
not a huge amount of buy-in. Uh, and we really want to kind of connect with everyone again. And again, you would be helping the county in doing this. You get something for yourself, a bit of value, but in our fundraising efforts, you'll be supporting the girls and even just getting the crowd there just for the girls to see because it's been an incredibly difficult period for the players. They haven't won a game this year. They've drawn one game. And like for a very young group, that's mentally extremely tough. Um, and we've got some really special young players there and they just need a bit of a boost and need to see that they have that support. So if you're coming for, because you're a coach and you want to give that bit of, get that bit of value, brilliant. If you're coming because you're a kid and you want to run around with Andrea Morn or Claude Dunn, brilliant. Or if you're someone who just wants to support Leash Ladies Football, just get there and look, we'll look after you. We'll give you a bit of tea and a bit of sandwich and it'll be really appreciated. So that's us. Yeah, I want, I want to pick you up on a couple of the coaching-based things in a second because it, it is fascinating. But just for, to further your point about the Leash Ladies and, and the connection with the public there, like I was at the homecoming celebrations when they won the All-Ireland Intermediate um, a couple of years ago now. And uh, to think, it, it kind of shows where ladies football truly is if, if they can be up there at that point and then be experiencing what they've experienced in recent months and at la- the tail end of last year. Um, the, 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 the infrastructure uh, to make the most of super talented players, that's really what needs development, I guess. Yeah, and look, like the teams change and turnover happens and what's happened in Leash has happened, but we're starting fresh and uh, it's very fresh. And look, probably a lot of the younger girls that have come into the group are not ready for inter-county football, but what I've, like people have made comments uh, and they haven't appreciated the comments about some of the younger players in our group that they're not good enough, but they're the ones who are there and they're the ones who have committed to the Kamaz and they're the ones that are still fighting despite the year of hardship that they have. The players are there. They've been let down by some people who haven't committed and some people who have kind of left them high and dry. But we're here together with them and we're fighting. And what I'm saying to people out there is just look, try to reserve judgment until you've, until you've actually come and helped yourself. And if even if you come on Saturday and that's your way of helping, brilliant. Um, the infrastructures need to be improved massively within our county. Like um, Basic processes need to be there so that we are sustainable, so that it doesn't change from manager to manager. And that there's a plan. And whoever does come in as manager after myself, has to pick up where they have been and everything's there and it's just run and away we go and there's a way of working. So that's what we're kind of trying to work on while making sure that we get players understanding of the responsibility of representing your county, uh, performing every time, being really process driven, breaking it down, understanding how we're going to win and how we're going to succeed. Uh, and it's it's a much younger group than I did anticipate and a much more inexperienced group than I did anticipate. And that's a challenge in itself, but it's a massive opportunity for the county, if we can view it in that kind of an exciting approach that players like Kira Malone and Aoife Gorman, who are 17 years of age and are incredibly special talents that we should be nurturing. And yes, they should have older players around them helping them and carrying the burden with them of representing their county and going through this tough period together. But we have them and we just have to mind them now and we have to make sure that they understand what it means to play for Leash. Uh, that they have the support around them that on the bad days that it's not, we're not relying on 17-year-olds. Um, but it is an exciting time and an exciting time to think about that these 17-year-olds are in our system. So now it's up to us to hold on to them and make sure that we can make them the best that we can be. Yeah, and getting in on the journey at this point means that the payoff for a Leash fan uh, is going to be all the greater in the coming uh, weeks, months and years heading forward as the group develops. Stephen, uh, a question on coaching then from your experience uh, is... Part of the edge that can be gotten in preparing a panel or a team about closing the gap between what happens Monday to Friday and what happens on a match day pitch. It seems like a lot of coaching now is uh, trying to immerse players in a similar situation as possible during the week to what they're going to find themselves in at the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, I used to, we used to have a joke, and when I was over Port Leash. For the first three months, we were an athletics club because they would never have seen the football. And like that's probably not right either, too. And But a lot of players would take confidence in doing the hard yards. But really, in this day and age, like uh, like the players we all have are smart players. Um, and especially when they come into an inter-county setup, they probably have the basic skills. And uh, there's definitely still a place for a drill, in inverted commas. And I know there's a snobbery towards the old-fashioned style of a drill, but I still see the, the place for it. And it's definitely a great way for actually making people engaged and get them into the process and making them feel a little bit more confident in what they're doing. But really, like the lacking that we have amongst some players who are kind of coming to senior now, where they haven't got this, is that kind of 
uh, game smartness and game knowledge and understanding. So really what we should be trying to do with our kids, in my opinion, and it's only my humble opinion, is that we should be looking to kind of expose them to game scenarios, smaller sided games in constrained areas where there's conditions on the game where they're having to make a decision. Uh, and then the coach and opportunity is really there when they are making that mistake. And we want to encourage them to make that mistake because that's the process of learning. Um, but then asking them what did they see or why did they make that decision. And make that, that's really when the learning process starts because we don't know it all as coaches. And, and a lot of the time, a player might say something that might make you just trigger a different thought process that you've never had before. I encountered that a number of times with certain players. I think Ellen Healy changed... And it had changed my way of thinking a number of times that I hadn't just considered it from that perspective. But it just allows, and we've all, as coaches, experienced the, the, where you're just talking and talking and talking and you're wondering, is any of this going in? But through the games of based approach and the leading questions and the open-ended questions, it just said that, that learning experience and the learning environment can just flourish, uh, flourish a little bit more than probably just the dict- dict- dictatorial approach and uh, just coaching the skill and how to do the skill rather than when to use it, why should I use it, where should I use it, uh, and how best to use it. So it's just that little bit more brand. Now, there is, that, as I said, that snobbery towards all, being all game-based. I think that's probably a little bit too far, and some people might argue that. And Again, that's a great conversation to be having. There's still a place for the drill, and depends on the people that you have and skill level that you have and the day that they turn up. Has it been a hard day or a bad day? And maybe like, they don't want to be fully into engaging in a conversation around the game but if just we can spread our mindset that little bit or spread our thought process that little bit more and I think the conversation on Saturday morning will definitely do that because that's where I had this trigger process before was a number of years ago at a coaching course led by Colin Clear so um, I think there's massive opportunity for coaches if they're willing to be open-minded towards uh, coaching and new practices and means. Next on Health and Fitness you're about to meet the man behind the roaring success of Buccaneers Minis Rugby. Health and Fitness with the newly refurbished Midlands Park Health and Fitness Club. Refresh your fitness journey with dedicated personal trainers on hand to help you achieve your goals. Find out more at midlandsparkhotel.com. Midlands 103. Now, Buccaneers uh, mini season uh, just wrapped up uh, recently. They've also announced a new sponsor, so plenty positive happening in Buccaneers Rugby Club at a youth level. I'm very glad to say that the Minis coordinator, Declan Brady, uh, joins us uh, to look back on uh, how things have gone uh, this year or this campaign and season, um, Declan, but also uh, to look forward to the future. Uh, Tell us then, uh, over the course of uh, the most recent uh, mini season, uh, how did things go? Hi, David. First of all, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, it's been extremely successful this year. Um, we decided at, at, from an early point of the season that we were going to change it from a Saturday to Sunday because we kind of noticed we were competing against a lot of other sports in and around the Athlone area. So um, I suppose we kind of took a a bit of a jump into the darkness, but it was a huge success for us personally. Um do, uh, doing the minis training on a Sunday morning mm. because we saw a huge number numbers of an increase from all age groups. And um, so from that point on, it, it was extremely positive. Okay, so participation has gone very well with that adjustment. Uh, for those listening who might be entirely certain, then uh, give us the parameters of minis rugby. Uh, who's it for and uh, what's the, 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 the motivation behind it? Yeah, so as you can imagine, um, with Minis Rugby, it's all about introducing kids to the sport in a fun and a safe environment. It's where, I suppose, boys and girls from the ages of about 6 to 12 start learning the basics of the game. Um, you know, i.e. like running with a ball, learning how to pass, catch, kick, while making new friends, I suppose, and having fun doing so. So the emphasis is on the participation the participation and enjoyment rather than the competition aspect of it, which as you, when you go into youths, that's when, you know, the tournaments come in, you know? So as coaches, we focus on just teaching the fundamentals like teamwork, sportsmanship, respect for others, respect for referees. It's not, it's not about winning. It's about developing the love of the game and kind of building the confidence both on and off the field for kids that may, might might struggle in, in, in other sports. 
So it's not a million miles away from the GA's version of the, the Go games, for instance, uh, which uh, we've uh, featured on the programme recently. I'd be interested to get your perspective on, on parents' reactions when they drop their kids off to minis and they go through a season or a year uh, with their child in it. Um, what's the feedback you get from parents? My vision would be to, let's say, bring everyone together inform the parents that, you know, at the end of the day, we're all volunteers as well. And the smallest help would be a huge advantage to everyone as a whole within the club. So I think as parents during the season kind of saw what I was trying to do, I did receive a lot of messages at the end of it saying how much they did enjoy enjoy it, how relaxed it was. Like I'll give you an example. At the end of each blitz, we would host, say, the travelling club and we would get sandwiches, you know, a few treats for the kids, teas and coffees for the parents. So everyone kind of comes in after the games, have a little chat. And, you know, a lot of people feel very relaxed within that environment. And then before you know it, you know, new friends are, are, are being formed that might not have never had the chance of doing so. Yeah, when um, you mentioned that you know, you're volunteering uh, in, in this role. Uh, to be the co- coordinator for it, it, it must take up a fair bit of time. Just as a first part to this question, uh, just about uh, how much time uh, does it take out of uh, your no normal week? You <laughs> Definitely no one tells you that, all right. Um, <laughs> yeah, it could easily take. Um, no, I suppose I, I probably put a bit of pressure on myself as well because I have a, obviously I come from Dublin, so... Th- the, my previous clubs would have had a large catchment area in relation to minis and we would have focused very largely on minis. And uh, so my goal would be to at least double the amount of minis in and around the catchment area of Athlone. So I'm always coming up with new ideas to, you know, entice parents, children, try to inform parents, you know, how safe the game is, especially at this age, and that it is about enjoyment and it's more on the basis of your child having fun than, let's say, the competitive aspect of it. But I would definitely say I, at least an hour a day anyway. And yeah. then obviously when it comes to the blitzes and stuff, would be oh, I could be, do two, three hours. Like, for example, even for next season, we've arranged now, we have a new, we were going to have a new supplier for all our garments. It's going to be a Zuri. So I was, myself and... Um, the, the new coming president, uh, Lorna, we spent a lot of time um, in participation to actually bring forward the different suppliers just to show the executive what what is out there and, you know, the positives of potentially having, you know, a local supplier within Ireland and obviously keeping Irish jobs and, you know, keeping it within the country as well, I thought was a, bit, was a big up and a big plus for me. But that obviously then uh, took a, a fair amount of commitment time-wise from, from yourself just in that one example. Uh, the second part of my question was going to be about uh, why you do it. And obviously you've touched on one of the reasons there. You're putting a lot of time in because you've been a, a, an ambition to really grow uh, the numbers in minis for Buccaneers Rugby. Uh, beyond that then, what's your motivation behind uh, spending so much of your time volunteering for the club? Um. Well, obviously, I played rugby since I was nine. I have a huge um, passion for the game. I've travelled the world with rugby. I've, tra- I've, let's say, I've played from Australia all the way up to Alaska, and many, many countries in between that. Um, I've, I still have friends all over the world that I know I could ring at at, at any stage, and they'd have a bed for me in a heartbeat, and vice versa. Obviously, um, I, I just think it's. It's it's a, it's a, it's a different type of sport that it really emphasizes on respect for your for your opponents. Most of all, like as I say, like whatever happens on, on the pitch stays on the pitch, and then afterwards you can, you can sit down, you can have a talk. Well, obviously, as adults, you can have a drink with them, you know. Um, and I just think for children, it just opens up so many different opportunities as they grow up in relation, if ever they decide to go to Australia, go to New Zealand, go to even scholarships now in the USA. It just opens up so many different avenues for children um, when they begin to take it a bit more seriously. But as I said, fundamentally for me, I have three children that are all in the minis sections of, of, of uh, Buccaneers. So my main drive for them is that they want to wake up on a Sunday morning and go, oh, 
are we going to rugby now? And, and, and you know, know that they're happy going there and they're going to a safe environment where, you know, they're learning new skills and they're actually learning about how to be confident as a person while having fun. Parents listening who are considering getting their children into rugby or otherwise, uh, if they are not necessarily initiated in, in, in participating in the sport, if they've not played it, if they've only observed it, on television through the Six Nations or whatever it is, uh, there's a maybe a growing constituency or certainly a, a present constituency of people who are concerned about the physicality of the sport, the question of concussion. Uh, minis is obviously very different. How do you feel about the direction rugby is generally travelling in uh, from a parent's perspective, as you are one and your kids play rugby, but also um, from someone who deeply cares about the sport as well? Oh, massively. Like, And I, I, I have to... Um say in relation to let's say people's concerns in relation to concussion and of course everyone's going to have concerns like rugby is a physical game but that's what people are seeing on a week in week eight they're professional players with an absolute army of physicians you know doctors nurses um in the background but when it comes down to your local club the rules are a mass difference in relation to even the, the height of the tackles and it's everything in around the waist down to the knees is what's only tolerated in relation to, let's say if there was what we'd consider like a bit of a, a bit of a tackle from a child that might be too high, that child is taken off to the side straight away. And we actually are, are participating in first aid courses where it really focuses on you know, identifying concussion and stuff like that. Gladly, as I see, and as you said as well, in minis, it doesn't really have happened that often because the contact isn't there. It's more about learning the basic skills, the concepts of the game, developing their ability and the cognitive skills, their ability to understand the game differently from what you'd see as a as a professional. Yeah, and on what we're talking about there, ultimately, uh, sport uh, can create injuries in every context and in just about every sport uh, and uh, rugby no different in that regard. Uh, Just as we wrap up our chat, Declan, uh, looking forward, um, uh, the uh, Minis operation in Buccaneers has uh, picked up a new sponsor as well. So uh, from your perspective, you're probably happy to see that uh, this aspect of the club uh, is being uh, supported uh, over the next few years. Yeah, yeah, and and I'd I'd like to really thank Groveland um, Childcare for coming on board. I know um, Ronan himself; he had children in in Buccaneers growing up, and he always remembered the fun times he had with them. And I think he wants to um, highlight the fact that how much he did enjoy his time when he was coaching down there, and to be able to support us in relation to you know. Uh, Set to new jerseys and um, balls, you know all the all the small things that I suppose a lot of you don't really think about comes into a cost when it comes to a club. But like when you have two hundred, two hundred and fifty kids, you know you, you want to make sure that they're kitted out right and that they have the right equipment. And with the funding from Groveland and stuff like that, it just makes it so much easier for us not to have to worry about not to have to worry about that aspect of it, that we can just order what we need and we know we can have it through their funding. So I'd like to take a big thanks again to Groveland's for coming on board. How much do you know about the work guide and assistance dogs do? You might learn something next. Health and fitness with the newly refurbished Midlands Park Health and Fitness Club. Take the plunge in a new routine with our swimming pool, plunge pool, jacuzzi, sauna and steam room. For more, visit midlandsparkhotel.com. Midlands 103. Next week, Irish Guide Dogs for the Blind have uh, their Guide Dog Day, which will kick off a sequence of events over the course of the weekend, starting Friday the 24th into the 25th and the 26th. I'm very glad to say that Robin Russell joins us from Offaly Guide Dogs uh, to look forward to some of the things going on locally and to talk about um, Irish Guide Dogs for the Blind uh, a bit more specifically about uh, what guide and assist- assistance uh, dogs do. Robin, uh, thanks very much for joining us on the programme. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so it's a big weekend for Irish Guide Dogs for the Blind, Guide Dog Day and in Offaly, uh, there's a few bits and pieces uh, going on as well. So will we run through what's happening and then we can talk about the work that gets done uh, 
364 days of the year beyond the one coming up. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, David. Friday 24th, we have an event in the Bridge Centre in Tullamore here. Okay. So we will have some volunteers from the newly established Offaly branch of the Guide Dogs. Um, we'll be doing some, some fundraising. We'll also have some dogs there on the day to, for people to meet and greet. Um, there's loads of information and loads of fun on the day. So we'd love if people could join us. Um, And then on the Saturday morning, the park run here in Tullamore has very kindly collaborated with us um, so we can do our guide dog walk. Um, It kicks off at half nine that morning. It's a free event. You can run, cycle, walk, jog, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, Everyone's welcome to come along, families, people on their own. You know, it's just a fun, free event. There's no onus on anybody to, you know, win a race or, you know, at everyone's own pace. Um, And obviously dogs are welcome as well. And there's loads of stuff happening across the country beyond that. Uh, In terms of um, the public's relationship with guide dogs, I I think I certainly get the feeling when one walks past me in the street, I just feel great. Like, and I I think they're incredible creatures uh, and and the work that they do. Uh, You must when, say, for instance, in the Bridge Centre, when you'll be holding a collection on Friday, that's the type of moment in, where you experience the kind of public's respect for what uh, guide dogs do. I think as well, um, just to kind of raise awareness, because before kind of starting our journey, before we even had an assistance dog, I wouldn't have known too much about the guide dogs and the work that they do. And then as well, because there's no assistance dogs in the name, I would have always thought it was just for the visually impaired, you sure. know. Um, but it's also for families like ours who have children who are on the spectrum, who are massive flight risks and need that kind of extra pair of paws to kind of keep them safe. Um, so I guess a working dog, they have a jacket and they have equipment attached to them and then you kind of attach your child if, you know, with a safety belt and um, it keeps that child safe. It anchors them if they go to kind of, you know, run off or if they kind of something catches them that they their attention, they just want to just take flight, I suppose. Um, so a lot of people wouldn't kind of know that the work that they do. So it's important for us to kind of raise awareness as well. Um, about this kind of vital charity because it does kind of change lives of families like ours and those who are visually impaired as well. So, And you can actually speak to that personally then. Um, they're incredible animals then to be able to ground themselves and the person beside them in that kind of way. Yeah, so I guess from our point of view, um, our daughter is nearly eight years of age. She was diagnosed at two and a half and she just was a massive like flight risk and she's no sense of danger or awareness. You know, she doesn't kind of, if you call her name, she doesn't come back. So if something catches her attention, whether it's a puddle or a river, she's gone. Yeah. Um, so essentially, Elton has been our lifeline. You know, he's given our family a chance to do the day-to-day things that people kind of take for granted. So, you know, like going shopping, you know, just day to day family events and, you know, real life stuff that you would have never kind of thought about before. Yeah. So he's given me, I suppose, that freedom and that security that she's going to be kept safe. And that, I mean, you know, it gives her independence as well, that she doesn't need to be confined. And you've got Elton in with us uh, this afternoon. He's real chill. Uh, he's a gorgeous dog as well. And um, he must, uh, he, he seems, he seems very happy go lucky. He is, he's extremely, but he just loves people. So I suppose it's kind of important to mention at this point as well, when he has the jacket on um, and he's attached to my daughter, I suppose that's when essentially he's working. He's on the job. Yeah, he's on the job. So as like, you know, people want to like come over and rub him down and pet him and everything, it's just kind of to tell people kind of not to kind of do that while he's working because it can kind of distract him as well from the important job that he's doing. That's really good actually just as we're having this conversation it's an opportunity to put that information out mm-hmm. for, for people as well because the instinct with a gorgeous dog like Elton is to go over to him immediately and engage with them and if he's um, if he's actually working as you say and making sure that uh, your daughter is being taken care of he needs to be fully focused on that if possible people respect the jackets, admire the dog, but ultimately they're in the middle of their job. Yes, of course. And I mean, it's, you know, it's so hard not to kind of just go straight over and rub them down. And I mean, they're gorgeous animals. They're like really highly trained. But at the end of the day, he's still a dog. So he can get easily distracted if somebody's kind of coming over or calling him. So it's really kind of important when we're out and about. And if, you know, you do see a child attached or equally if you see a guide dog, that you don't try and distract that dog because... I often kind of use the example, if a surgeon was performing, you know, surgery on your loved one, Mm. you wouldn't go and shake their hand. So equally, you know, if a dog is doing their job, then just to not kind of approach the dog or kind of, you know, call him or, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah so. it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, the event's taking place uh, next week. Uh, will you be at the collection yourself and at the park run yourself? And yeah, all that? Um, I'll be at both events. Um, we'll Class. be in the Bridge Centre. And then I suppose the exception on Friday when we're at the event with the dogs is people can kind of come over and say hello and, you know, give them that bit of attention and Great. Um, that love. So, yeah. That's great. I think it's a really nice idea to get them uh, to partner up with the park runs. Like they, that, that seems like a natural fit for some reason, doesn't it? Yeah, Jack has been absolutely amazing. As soon as we approached him, he was like, absolutely no problem at all. Mm. Um, and the fact that it's a free event, there's no fundraising done at it. It's just to raise awareness and people to get out and enjoy the canal. Like we have a beautiful um, Grand Canal there in Tullamore and it's really well run. It's really well organised. So to be kind of collaborating with them is just amazing. You know, to get families like ours out because it, we now can do this. We could never walk beside the water before. So that kind of new sense of freedom for our family as well. It's important to kind of highlight you know, that for us and that the work that these dogs do. So Elton really helps you enjoy the amenities as a family as much as everyone else can then. Absolutely. We can go anywhere now. You know, there's there's no limit to kind of where we can go or areas that we can, you know, even I think it's for the whole family, not just for Aria. Like my son plays rugby. We can never go to his matches because Aria would run onto the pitch. So now with Elton, we've like attended every match this season. Amazing. Um, and it's made a difference, you know, for my son to have his family supporting him at sidelines like everybody else. Well, I think the work that these guide dogs do and assistance dogs do is remarkable and they deserve all the support that we can muster as a community. Uh, So uh, for Guide Dog Day and the uh, events taking place over the course of the weekend of the 24th, 25th and 26th, uh, loads to look forward to collections from the Offaly Branch of Irish Guide Dogs for the Blind um, at the Bridge Centre in Tullamore on Friday and then uh, that Guide Dog Walk at the Park Run in Tullamore. Jack Ryan's the Park Run man and uh, he'll be on site uh, with Robin uh, if you have any questions and if you want to find out how you can support Robin. Uh, Thanks to you and Elton for coming into us on Health and Fitness this evening. Thank you so much, Dave. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's Health and Fitness for another week. Joe Cooney is next with Country Roads after the news at eight. Take care of yourselves and I'll talk to you soon.